All right, Ben Bank. Today's Tuesday. It is November 14th. Welcome to the Dog Walk presented by Barstool Sports here with Chief as always. Chief, how are we doing? I'm great. I'm ready to go. Ready to go? Yeah. Ready to go. Back from Gainesville. We had a nice little boys trip out to Naperville yesterday. It's been good. Yeah. How was Gainesville? Good? Yeah, it was fine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a college town. You know, it was <laughs> yeah. good. Yeah. I've been there before. I went to Florida, Florida State game. Okay. I didn't go in the stadium, but I did the whole tailgate partying thing. So. Yeah. Like, so, te- like, like probably like a decade ago. Supposedly, it kind of had the same issue that we had in uh, when we went to Athens. Where like the majority of the student population was out of town, oh, so no uh, yeah, I'm over two on these college trips yeah. just through bad luck. But it's nice. To, I mean, sometimes it's better. You get to see the lay of the land without it being like too insane. Yeah, you know. But we're they, then they weren't home. That was a road. They're at LSU, yeah. and then I guess the way they do it is for whatever reason this week, some kid was saying that like 95 percent of like Greek life on. Uh, Florida's campus, they all go to New Orleans. Mm. So it's like, oh, Florida's playing LSU. Let's go to New Orleans. We'll take it over. And I guess that's like tradition. So they're oh, all nice. gone. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, I'll be in San Diego this weekend for there you go. San Diego State. I'll be in a little San bit San different Jose climate. State. Yeah, a little bit different. I'll be in Canton, Illinois. Oh, shit. Hunting deer. Oh, that's right. That's yeah. right. You're going hunting with Sydney. Yeah. That's right. Uh, oddly enough, I mean, I know San Diego is not particularly wine country, even though I, California is kind of a little bit more. Northern California is. Yeah, yeah, I know that's Napa. Yeah, um, but and that's what we're talking about today. We're doing wine, getting in, getting into wine. We're doing wine. Yeah. You know what's some great attire to wear to uh, drink some wine too, and just like be casual and just just be cool. I'm guessing it's rollback. It's rollback. That's what popped in my head. Is that yeah, the ad? That's rollback. Okay. See, you knew it without even yeah. saying it. Well, it's because they have those, like the shirts and the hoodies and the chinos and the, and the joggers, where it's like you can walk into a bar. You can walk into a tasting room. You can walk anywhere with rollback and look good. Yeah, exactly. Yep. It, it could be wine. It could be beer. It could be whatever. Mm-hmm. They don't have chinos, though. They have hoodies. They have crewnecks. They have joggers. Uh, they got these new uh, fleece pullovers. Very comfortable. Mm-hmm. Perfect for a chilly day or night out. Super comfortable stuff. Yeah, I, I need one of the crewnecks. Yeah. Need it. I'm you a see, crew neck guy. Yes. Everyone, I'm wearing one right now. I need a crew neck. Yep, exactly. You see there's someone that rocking that dog logo or those mm-hmm. two stripes in the back. You just you just know that yeah. they're rollback guys. Uh, so use code Saw dog. that down in Florida. Did you? I mean, it is see the shining sheet, see rollbacks everywhere. That's great. Yeah. That's great. And you could be a rollback guy. And you use code dog on rollback.com for 20% off. For all new customers through the end of this week, that's spelled R H O B A C K dot com. That's twenty percent off all hoodies, joggers, and polos with code DOG. It's now holiday season, and uh, you uh, don't want to be late this year. So make sure to check them out at Roback dot com. No joke. I had a buddy who just he hit me up. He's like, "Yeah, I just use them for the first time." He's like, "My biggest issue is I only ordered one pair of joggers." Big mistake. Yeah, yeah. He's like, "I yeah. need to go back and get more." Well, it is twenty percent off right now. So use yeah. that that promo. It's unbelievable. Week, yeah. yeah. So go go grab it. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, let's talk some wine. Yeah. So th- this I learned a lot through the research of this. They have the first evidence of wine in the world, and they do like you know, um, different studies and thing. What's the Indiana Jones archaeology about these different things? The first wine that they found was actually in China. It was eleven thousand years ago. They did like a rice wine mixed with honey thing, and they found it like if they there's some rudimentary pottery that they can be like, oh, like this was used for, for making or drinking wine. But it's 11,000 years old. It's the oldest thing in the world. That's older than the pyramids. It's older than fucking everything. It's older than civilization. Like they're older than the written language. Older, th- Literally, it's like the oldest thing in the world. And it just goes to show you that people have just been loving getting fucked up since we could even think. Because that's the if you have as one of the pillars of – your entire society everywhere in the world, basically everywhere in the world drinks and the most common beverage still is wine. And the fact that it goes all the way back, like pre civilization really tells you something. And so that was, that was 11,000 years ago, but it wasn't like the wine that we think of when we think of wine that the oldest, the oldest vineyards in the world, the oldest winemaking region in the world is in, is like in the Caucasus. It's in like, Armenia and Georgia. And I was actually when last time I was in New York, I had an Uber driver from Georgia. And Georgia is like right on the Russian border, like Caspian Sea, like uh, you know, not like the most thought of place in the world as like a wine hotbed, but that is the actual oldest. And they were drinking something that was pretty similar to like an unfiltered Mer- Merlot, they say, like a red wine. 
and that was six thousand years ago. Hmm. And that was there's a there's a theory that human beings love getting fucked up so much on alcohol that that was the thing that sparked civilization because prior to that we were hunter gatherers okay we were just looking around trying to find you know we're living in tents like basically living in teepees all over the world moving around nomadic and this right at the same time as wine wine production alcohol production is found is when you start seeing uh permanent like stone structures for like the first time in, in a real way agriculture for the first time in a real way uh, domestication of animals for the first time and um, like pottery in, in, on mass for the first time all kind of happened around the same time so the thinking is they're like man like we can't just be going around looking for these grapes or looking for you know they made all, they made like rudimentary beers and spirits too but we can't just be going around picking all these little grapes off these wild plants let's just grow this shit ourselves we'll stay in one spot then we'll have all the alcohol that we could ever want and they think that that's how civilization and like humans being like agricultural as opposed to hunter gatherers might have started with just the desire to get fucked up consistently huh isn't that crazy yeah it sounds awesome yeah it sounds awesome it was like hey why don't we just stop all this moving around stop looking for it we'll just make it ourselves Pretty, pretty incredible that we're he- you could make an argument that we're here living the way we are today just because people needed to get drunk. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I assume at least you see it in like all the uh, the old shows and the old movies. Like it was like an elite thing, right? Like the kings were drinking it. So kings were drinking it. Um, and so like so it was in this area of the world right around around the Mediterranean, the Caucasus, and it spread to like those ancient cultures, namely the ancient Egyptians. And that was really like the drink for just the pharaohs because Egypt doesn't really have a climate that's good mm-hmm. for mass production of uh, of wine. So they would have like the Phoenicians and all these kind of like sailing cultures around the Mediterranean would bring them the wine. And it was really only used by the pharaohs and, the, and then in like religious ceremonies. And the common people and like the slaves in Egypt, they would drink a beer, and what they would do is they would just chew up, like literally, like chew up uh, barley, wheat, like whatever, whatever grain they could find, chew it up in their mouth, and then spit it into some kind of pot and bury it. And the enzymes, like that, are naturally occurring in your mouth, will ferment the grains. So you're basically just drinking spit beer. But it would work and you would get drunk. So that's what the common folk drank. And then the the kings and the noble society and the religious leaders would drink the wine. But that was but you're right. Like it's been it has been like the the drink of the gods forever. And then after the Egyptians, you know, you had Greek society, ancient Greeks with all the philosophers of you know, Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, all those people, and like you've seen like the three hundred, like Sparta, like all those mm-hmm. kind of city states in Greece they had a better climate for growing grapes. So they became the first like ancient culture that was like wine is for everybody. Now like the good stuff obviously went to the kings and all the noble elites, but really it became like everybody was drinking wine all the time. Every like slaves were drinking it, peasants were drinking it, and then the elite, they're all drinking wine all throughout Greek culture. And they also have it like written down Whereas, like, if you were going to have, because that was, like, kind of the, one of the birthplaces of democracy and debate and all these things, that if you're if these philosophers or policymakers were getting together and they were going to discuss something, they had it written down that they would, everybody would drink first. So everybody would drink. Now, they would water it down because it was, like, considered, like, very, like, you're a barbarian if you get drunk, like, outwardly visibly <laughs> drunk but you wanted a little bit of a, something to take the edge off they said it provided mental clarity so you would have like watered down wine <laughs> in order to have these debates <laughs> thoroughly and then there's like another uh myth from from the greeks where it's like if you have an idea then you should get absolutely <clears throat> fucking hammered and you drink that and if you wake up and you still think the same thing then, then it's a good idea in your drunken state and your sober state, then you should go through with it. 
and that was like kind of one of their philosophies. But you w- you were never supposed to be drunk in public. You're only supposed to like drink responsibly and like el- like eloquently, and you did that by watering it down. But everybody was kind of just constantly having a little buzz on in ancient Greece because huh. they made so much of it. So they're I, known for like olive oil and grapes. I kind of like that though. Yeah. If it's if you feel it drunk and you feel it sober, then it should be. Then it must be a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> it must be a good idea. I guess unless if it's. I feel like you should. I mean, which way should be first? Drunk, right? You should feel yeah, if you, drunk if first, it's a, and then you should then, feel it sober. Yeah, I think that's probably the way it should be. Yeah. But I think I, the way I read it was the opposite. The opposite. Yeah, that's interesting. And um, and then you know, like that was that was the thing. So then it became the Egyptians use it in their culture, um, in their religious ceremonies because they, you know, that red wine kind of resembles blood, right? So that was that became a thing. And really anywhere in the Mediterranean, so like the Jews also became it became part of their uh, their culture as well. And then uh, same thing, they were using it in religious ceremonies, religious teachings. And then you know who was uh, he's attributed in like religious Christian Judeo Christian history as being like the first uh, winemaker and the inventor of fermentation. Obviously, he wasn't hmm. Noah, like Noah's Ark. Yeah. So Noah builds the ark famously, obviously two of every kind get on this boat. We got a flood coming and they survive the flood and eventually the flood um, subsides and they go back. And what is, what does he do post post ark? He becomes a winemaker. Oh yeah. That, he needed to start boozing fucking, after having yeah, two. Yeah. Just got to chill out every, a little bit. Two yeah. animal on a boat with him. That must have been a stinky ass boat. Yeah. But that was, that's the story is that like after he, they like resettle and he has his children and he becomes a winemaker and there's like a famous like line in the Bible where he's Noah. Like I, like, I don't know why this isn't taught maybe because of this, but Noah gets fucking blackout drunk, passed out naked in his tent. And he has this son named Ham, like like a ham, like a like a ham sandwich. And Ham walks into the tent, and he's like, "Look at this drunk asshole!" Like talking about his dad. Like this passed out. He goes and gets his two brothers, and his brothers like, "Ah, like don't make fun of dad." And they like get like um, like sheets and blankets and cover him. And then Noah wakes up, and it's like, "Hey, you were making fun of me. You saw my, you know, because he's just laying naked in the tent." And he goes, you you and all your children, all your generations are banished to be the servants of your other sons. So that was like, it's that's like one of the first like biblical passages is talking about Noah. And it's like, hey, like if, if your father has a bad moment, don't harp down on him. You should always respect your father, even as like most vulnerable, drunken, naked state. You should always respect your father. And that was like the, the line because Noah was just after, after he could do anything because he was like one of the only people left on earth. He's like I'm gonna be a I'm gonna be a vineyard guy, hmm. winery guy, which I think you know a lot of a lot of rich people when they get like hey you could do anything what are you gonna do I'm gonna be a I'm gonna grow have a have a vineyard like, yeah a rich like it's all, it's usually like hey we're gonna get a couple couple sheep couple yeah you know chickens we're gonna get back to the yeah we're gonna do that back to the basics I and think it'd be cool to kind of have a little 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 vineyard I would love that yeah I would love that and it's just like because you always like that's the they say the thing about. Um, like the best areas for vineyards, they're always in like a somewhat arid climate. So it's not like you're like getting constantly drenched with rain. Like you're not really doing it, but you want like places like Italy where they, you know, that's an arid climate, but then you have so much moisture just in the air because you're near a large body of water. So, so Napa is that way. Uh, Chile, which is the first, uh, that was the first place to have a vineyard in the new world it was Chile. Cause they just have the Pacific breeze coming off. Same thing with Napa, even in the, in the interior of the United States, the number one wine making region in the Midwest is Michigan because they get all like the moisture that Southwest Michigan, they get all the moisture blowing off, uh, blowing off Lake Michigan is, it ends up being a pretty good region to grow wines. Mm. Um, and then same thing, Italy, Greece, they're along the Mediterranean, Australia, New Zealand, they do wines well, South Africa does wines well, and it's all the same thing. Arid climate, not too hot, not too cold, with a lot of just moisture in the air without like heavy, heavy rains at the same time. Mm-hmm. So Oregon, kind of same thing, just that mist rolling in, rolling in on off the Pacific. So that's kind of the, the key. And obviously, if you look around the Mediterranean, that's like 
the entire Mediterranean. And that's why it became such, like the Greeks made it part of everyday life. And then the Romans took it and they brought it everywhere. So like, like the Romans did. So the, the Rome was originally like a colony of Greece. So Rome, they had a lot of their principles, a lot of their, uh, their whole culture was adopted from the Greeks. And then when they became the Roman empire, they were building roads, architecture, all these different things. The other thing that they brought was vineyards and winemaking. So that's how it got to France. That's how it got to Germany. That's how it got to all these Spain, Portugal, all these other places because Rome conquered everything. And they're like, oh, these places would be pretty good for making wines too. And that's how it became. And Christianity spread that way just through the Roman Empire. They built the roads. They, the, all their ideas and culture and everything just traveled along those roads, including the, the knowledge and ability to make wines. And that all came that all came from them too. And I want to go back to the Greeks for a second here because they had a guy named Dionysus. You ever heard that name before? I don't think so. So Dionysus, let me. So he was considered the god of wine. So a god of a few of a few things like fertility, agriculture, but specifically one of the gods of wine. He had he had a few tricks up his sleeve. Okay. Uh, he he was actually the son of Zeus. And his mother was a was a virgin. Okay, kind of interesting. Uh, his birthday is right around the winter solstice, so like end of December. He had this trick where he could turn water into wine. Mm. He traveled with a band of followers, about twelve guys, and then uh, he said, if you know, they had the ritual of the religious ceremony. If you would drink his blood, you would have like eternal life in kingdom in the kingdom of heaven. Sound like anybody else you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's like the yeah. story of Jesus is like kind of just plucked from Dionysus, yeah. the god of wine. And it's like, so say. yeah, it's all the it's all the exact same shit uh, as, as Jesus and Dionysus is kind of like a carbon copy. They just kind of change the words around. And but same thing, like Jesus did the water into wine. He did the, you know, that's we still do that in church today where you you go up and get you go up and get the host and you get a little sip of the wine. And that's the blood of the body and the blood of Christ. And that was a tradition that was supposedly, allegedly passed down from the ancient Greek religious ceremonies uh, honoring Dionysus. Yeah, I mean. Same fucking story. It really is. Same story. Um, Water into wine. Water into wine. And then, you know, you're kind of going through, and it's like you have the Roman Empire falls, right? So you descend into this era where it's like, it's the dark ages where it's like, you just have these little warring kingdoms all over Europe and th- power is constantly changing hands. But the drinking culture left by the Romans becomes like vital to the history of the region and the health of the region, because that's what people would drink to kind of get liquids in them and stay alive. Because if you just, if you just drank the water, it was, a lot of times it was dirty water, so you had to filter it through. So you did, yeah, yeah, so you wouldn't get like diphtheria and things like this. So you look at like the old, um, like Chaucer and these ancient books or like writings about like the the Middle Ages. They're always drinking their ales and their wines and things like that because there wasn't just clean water around. So you needed the alcohol in there to kill off all the bacteria. And that was like, so, so it was like, you know, a glass of wine a day, keep the doctor away sort of thing. So it became like everybody in the, in Europe and all of our ancestors were all drinking all the time. And it's like the way we talk about alcohol now, where it's like, you have like Andrew Huberman and all these doctors being like, yo, this stuff can be very bad for you. you better do it in moderation. It's like bad for your brain, bad for this, but it's like, Back then, it was it was like the nectar of the gods and like the way to a healthy life because you couldn't just go to the streams and be drinking water because you would get like these bacterial diseases that were all over the place in those societies that didn't really understand germ theory. They didn't really understand sanitation. They just knew that the only thing that they could really drink consistently without developing some like terrible illnesses was wine and and other things but Mm -hmm. really but really the most common thing was to drink wine and a a watered down wine 
That's pretty interesting. Yeah. It just stems from, hey, don't maybe drink more of this, not more water. Yeah, just drink. Yeah, yeah. you have to drink just, something. You need fluids. Yeah. But you can't drink. You just can't drink water. Because so, it's not. Because it's, it's not clean enough for yeah. you. It's not sanitary Purified. enough for you. Yeah. Um, also should note as well, Chief, I do want to talk about a new sponsor today. I'm thrilled about this sponsor. They're in the wine game. And mm-hmm. you guys know them for sure. They're Franzia. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So slight ain't so. Uh, holidays are better with France. Franzia Cabernet Sauvignon Box has a new look for the holidays and a sweater to match. The box is literally a gift, one that all of your friends will thank you for. With a gift tag on the front, this limited edition holiday box is available for purchase in retail stores nationwide while supplies last. This holiday sweater is lit. Literally, it lights up. So you can be the star of your friends giving in every other That's sweater sweet. party this holiday season. Yeah. Very sweet. Check those out. Yeah, very yeah. sweet. Uh, our five liter box. One five-liter box, excuse me, of Franzia offers 34 glasses or six bottles, making Franzia Cabernet big enough to share with friends all season long. Maybe you prefer a white or blush wine instead. We've got you covered. Franzia has a wine for all of you and your friends with a range of tastes from smooth, crisp, fruity, bold, and refreshing. Uh, whatever you your preference, the more the merrier. Wine is, wine is like good friends you want plenty around. Just make sure you join responsibly. Copyright 2023, Franzia Vineyards, Ripon, California. Pick up Franzia's limited edition Cabernet box in stores while supplies last. And shop the Franzia Holiday Merch Collection at shop.franzia.com. That's a great gift to get someone. It is. Like it, an old school friend. Like, that's sweet. Big time. And it's like, I do love the box with a little handle on there. You know what else it does? It fits night nice and neat in your fridge so it's just always cold and it stays fresh because it's in that bag so i this is like everyone talks about soup season i feel i don't know if a stew is a soup but i've been making lots of stews lately and i love just being in the kitchen because what you do you get the meat in there you brown it up and then you take it out and then you take a glass of wine you deglaze the pot it gets it all the flavors and gets all the like the little bits up makes it oh, so good but it's like all right one for the stew one for me and mm-hmm. it's just it just get that franzia pour it in your glass have a swig dump it in refill it drink more and it's just like it enhances the entire cooking and eating experience yeah and so yeah like i like the reds this time of year uh but they've got it all for you franzia is franzia is the best and yeah, like we great. discovered that almost by accident mm-hmm. how good it is we were doing the taste test challenge and dave thought it was worth 80 dollars, and then we're like you know what this is actually pretty good. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, Franz is the best. Yeah, just talk, buy a box for the fr- for the friends. Buy a box it's for that the, easy. Buy so. a box for the fellas. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Six bottles. That's such a good deal too. It's it's, it's, value it's an in insane that. amount. Yeah, value in that. Yeah. Uh, so good stuff. Yeah. Happy to have Franzi on board here. Yeah, Franzi is great. Mm-hmm. A little Franz giving. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. Um. All right. So so continue on. Yeah. So and then same thing. So now you're towards like the end of the. Uh, of the middle ages you get up to the 13th century you end up having they call it the little ice age okay so little ice age comes through and we talked about this on an episode somewhat recently plummet uh t- global temperatures plummet so they the thinking was that there was a giant volcano somewhere throws up all this debris effectively kind of blocks out the sun so all of n- northern europe for like a f- 400 500 year period is much colder so you used to have vineyards in uh, England, in Denmark, Germany, northern northern France. Obviously, France is known like the Bordeaux region. Mm-hmm. Southern France, they still make great wines. Um, fucking Russia, Scandinavia, all these places were all able to make wines prior to 1300. Then you have this, you know, 500 year cold rush, and that's really when those cultures in those areas pivoted away from wine because they couldn't similar to Egypt, but on the opposite end of the spectrum, they just didn't have the climate for uh, wine producing anymore. So it was, it got too cold. So they made hardier grains and hardier types of alcohol. That's so it's like, you think about Ireland and Mm -hmm. Scotland, you're thinking about, you know, scotches and whiskeys and Russia, it, Russia and, and Sweden, Scandinavia, all those places you're thinking like the vodkas and all those things because they're like, well, we still need to get drunk, obviously, and we still need to have a drinking supply uh, because we don't, we can't trust our own water. So they kind of like beer and wine and ales had always been around, 
but they had gotten, or I'm sorry, beers and ales and spirits had been around, but they got away from it uh, because wine became, you know, it was, it was such a, like a religious ceremony that just became such a part of the culture from the Romans on up that they decided that, you know, that that was just such a commonality that they had to continue with that. They just had to pivot. And now as temperatures are rising again, Sweden in particular is getting back in the winemaking mm. game because they've, they're doing more like, uh, I don't know exactly what this is. I know Michigan places in Michigan do it a lot too. They're called ice wines. So I think it just depends on like when you harvest a grape, but Sweden's doing, they're doing ice wines again and they're starting to like, and they have that same kind of thing. It's a very coastal uh, country where most of their population, most of their land is around, um, what is that? The Baltic sea up there. Mm -hmm. And so they're starting to be like, Hey, like if temperatures continue to rise, we should start planting stuff now we can be like that could be a whole new industry for places that didn't really have much agriculture before now they're going to the thinking is if if we continue on this warming trend then they'll be these regions that were unable to grow wine in any, any real way for the last 700 years will now be able to do it again so there's there's like people that are doing investments and in, and in trying to come up with the right way to grow grapes in these traditionally colder climates that ha haven't been able to grow wine so wines wines on the come up again yeah i feel like it was oh wasn't there like a big thing like during covid or something where they got kind of hit where there was like too many i forget exactly there was a a thing where a lot of wines were produced or they were manufactured and they just had too many bottles to sell yeah uh, do you remember this I, I do remember that i also remember they had a thing where um, if you look in like the last maybe 15 years or so, you see way more synthetic corks in wine bottles mm -hmm. and you see a lot more screw caps and that's because like they're running out of cork. So cork comes from a particular type. No shit. Yeah. Cork comes from a particular type of tree. It's the bark of a tree. I believe they really primarily grow in Portugal and it's just like you can't replace the cork fast enough so it's becoming like hey like this is actually raising the price of wine and limiting our ability to make it because it was getting so competitive for uh to get the actual cork because it's just it's very difficult you know it's it only grows in so many places and there's just like a shortage because we're drinking more than ever china's drinking more than ever um they're doing a lot of the rice wine still but yeah that the rise of uh screw caps and synthetic cork corks is because of there was like a, a cork tree because uh, it's like that, like I said that that bark that gets harvested and it takes like three hundred years to grow it. That and you think about that too, like the planting, like hey, I'm going to plant this cork tree here, you know, I'm going to maintain these trees. Well, I'm going to be dead for two hundred something years before we're ever going to realize like the profits from the cork. But that's just like they, they've been growing them in that those areas for that long mm -hmm. because the demand's always been there. So you just keep on growing, keep on harvesting. Huh. Yeah. But that's that's why you're seeing more and more of these alternative packaging, whether it's in cans, in those great, great Franzia bags, mm -hmm. in, uh, um, and then like the, the screw caps and stuff too. Mm -hmm. And obviously the corks originally were just to keep it fresh, but. Yeah, and it, kept, yeah. it, and it did. And it's like a thing that would you could trust could stay in there. You could get it in and out relatively easily. Um, and it, yeah, it let like, the perfect amount of air in because you don't want to you don't want to oxidize your wine that's how it spoils but you don't want it to be like super airtight either you want it to decant so uh it will it will do a great job of like aging your wine like the right way mm. those little those little corks and but it's just it's just hard to harder now than ever to get your hands on them mm -hmm. all right have you ever been like you ever got like the full gamut of a wine tour so not really. I've uh, the only place I've ever done it is is Southwest Michigan. I used to. I've told you this before. I don't think I've ever told it on camera, but I used to do these like uh, these different tours where we would do, uh, you know, kayaking on the river. We'd do like a sledding thing, and one of our tours was to go down. We would get these buses and leave from Chicago and go up into Southwest Michigan, like St. Julian and all these like mm -hmm. great 
uh, Round Barn wine. You know, I heard that place. Yeah, awesome. it's it's great, and the yeah. wines are great, and it was a great time. Like, I feel like there was always like girls' birthday parties or bachelorette parties would be on these buses with us, and it was. I had a great time. Yeah. It, was, it was a lot of fun. It was, it was a fun time for early twenties, <laughs> Chief. We'll say that yeah. I had a great time. Yeah, and uh, and yeah, and you would go to Southwest Michigan and and do all the full tours and the tastings and you know buy a couple bottles and and then head back. But no, I've always wanted to go to Napa. Haven't done Napa, um, and I feel like that's really just the big one in the United States is Napa. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then like. Drew Bledsoe has like a, a decent vineyard now up in up in Washington, like Oregon and Washington. Like I feel like that's like the Pinot Noir capital of the world, and like so Bledsoe's in that wine game. Really, the whole West Coast of the United States or Pacific Northwest, Sorry, yeah, from like well, San Francisco, Napa, and then up. Oregon, that's where uh, uh, Jim Belushi grows his uh, grows his gas. Oh, is that right? Dang. I think there's a lot of that there. It's got like a big weed thing. Yeah. Well, you know, great that. climate for it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They get sunshine. and. But I don't understand. You said that it can't, there can't be too much rain. It rains all can't, the fucking time. Can't, but there. it's like a misting. Like, it's not like these torrential downpour. Like, you can't do it in Florida. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, where it gets, like, these, hot and muggy and downpour rains. Yeah. You get those real tropical. Uh, well, I think, right. But you want it to be, like, the clouds roll in, but it doesn't necessarily, like, pour on you so like and there's different wines and that's like they call it terroir okay so terroir i believe that means like of the earth so like that's why they have like the burgundy wines right well that's just that's burgundy france like you can get burgundy grapes and grow them in california it's not a burgundy because it's not it's different Mm -hmm. earth it's different soil but you can try to mimic it but it's just not going to be supposedly i don't have a palate for it Mm -hmm. but that's what they say and um and yeah, so like that's that is part of the thing. So if you have, if you're getting wine from Oregon and you're in, a, it's in a wetter climate than these other places, your wine is probably going to taste a little different, and the types of wines that you can make are going to be different versus Napa or Chile or South Africa or wherever. Dude, we say it all the time, but America is so fucking cool. America is so underrated. Yeah, it's I, awesome. Yeah, like just the topography or whatever the fuck. You yeah, call it. like going from. You know, the we have mountains, everything, the swamps to the flatlands. How to, many countries you know, have everything? The deserts. Yeah. Um, I don't great know. beaches. Great, like yes. some of the best beaches in the world. Mm-hmm. And it's like you, a lot of opportunity is born from where you are. Yeah. Location wise. Like you're here. I hear Illinois or Iowa. You're all right. You're corn. Corn. You know, yeah. you go to the West Coast. You're you're wine. But that was like, you know, they had like the land rushes and stuff back in the day. Where you had, have you ever seen? It's a Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman movie. I'm I'm blanking on the store on the name of it. Eyes Wide Shut. No, <laughs> earlier than that. I he, know it wasn't that. He's like an Irish immigrant who's a boxer, and so you know he grew up. Uh, yeah, thanks, Harry. He grew up in Ireland, and he was like basically an indentured servant, and he was farming potatoes far and away, far and away. Is in 1992, far and away, and so he's like farming potatoes, and he. Long story short, he comes to America and he's like, they're just giving away land. It's like, yeah, man, go west, young man, go west. And because he was like always working someone else's land. His father did the same thing. He died. The father died on that land. And he's like, I want to own my own land. And if you go to America, they got so much of it that they'll just give it to you. And you farm it however you like and you own the land and you're your own boss. And that was like kind of that was Thomas Jefferson's like dream for America was just like small farmers all across the country. Like everyone just had their own farm. And then, you know, you would still have universities and things like that, but it was all independent farmers. And we've kind of gotten away from that. But yeah, like if it's, you know, you get on that Oregon trail and you, hey, like this is a good spot here in Nebraska. And that's like the other thing I was talking to Chaps about this. So Chaps is on that trip to Florida with me and he's from down there. He's from Jackson. We actually drove right by like where his, where he grew up Mm -hmm. and from Jacksonville to Gainesville. It's like a two hour drive or something like that. Hour and a half. There's fucking nothing in between. Just nothing. People are, you know, peach stands. It looks a lot like Georgia when we did the Athens trip and same thing, Athens to Atlanta, not much in between. Dave and I have done the trip. We drive out to West nut, Nebraska to go Turkey hunt with Sydney Wells. 
There's nothing in between Chicago and Nebraska. There's still, just like Tom Cruise, that movie. I feel like they should still just be giving a land away. Yeah. There's just so much. We have so much space here. It just blows my mind. Like, we should, we could do anything here. That's like the American dream. Like, you can carve out a little piece of something for yourself. Uh, and that was born on, like, that, I, that Thomas Jefferson idea of, like, hey, we're just going to have a bunch of farmers running their shit i would love if someone if there's an article or something or someone who could tell me like what which state's land is worth the most and which is worth you know the the least by state yeah like just based on like hey here's what you could do with this climate here's Mm -hmm. what's here's you know what i mean like hey this is why i was like very very yeah you know the dakotas got oil underneath that well yeah well and we were you know that's the midwest was like the bread basket for the united states for so long so as we became more industrial you know it's like we keep you know we would remove farmland and it became but then it's like hey like iowa you're growing in a Kansas, like you're growing corn and wheat, not just for the whole country, but like we're exporting it too. Like we're mm-hmm. making so much food because the soil, and we've ruined it, degraded it. But like we, they're just like this soil is like just black and rich. Of you know, it's like this, just because the way the country was formed with the receding of the glaciers, it's like flat. It's not super rocky. Like it was, it was so much easier to farm in the Midwest than it was out east where you would like if you look at farms in uh it's like a you know i did like the the prep school thing the farms out in new england they don't have like wooden fences they have like the the old farms they're all stone walls because they just they'd be like trying to plow and like here's another fucking boulder put it in that pile over there and that's how they would make all these rock walls all across new england because it was just this really rocky soil where we didn't have that it was just like hey like Kind of clear the land and till it, and it's fucking ready to go. You'll have you know corn up to your eyeballs before you know it. So that really was you know that's like that was like the thing for like manifest destiny. You just go out there and settle it, and you'll be able to grow it. Mm-hmm. We're blessed. And it's like this country has, like you said, it's underrated. It has every resource in the world. That was like the other story too. Like when when the English first came to New England. And that we don't even really have these trees anymore, but they had these pine trees that were like hundreds of feet tall, not like big, as big as the redwoods, but like you'd have these old trees that were in, in new England that were like bigger than they, cause they had deforested all of England and Ireland to build their navy. So then they get here. They're like, we got ships for days out here. Look mm-hmm. at fucking Maine. It's all trees. Just chop them down and we'll make our boats. And that's where they started doing that. Yeah, I had, a, I had kind of a high thought the other day too. What's that? How did pirates get their ships? These like marauding band of uh, criminals. Like, do they know how to just build these giant ships too? Yeah. Or like, do they steal it? Who was the sneaky like pirate who was just great at engineering? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> was, <laughs> who who's making? Because it's like you would think that like the king of Spain or the king of England, be, and you're like you can't just sell a ship to pirates. Yeah. So they have to be able to make it on their own somehow. Uh, or there was a black market like there is for everything now. Or they just, yeah, or they steal them. Or they steal them, yeah, yeah, like you said. But I don't know about that. Maybe that could be a talk walk. How do the pirates even get their ships? Yeah. Yeah, for real. Yeah. Because they're still, I was seeing something the other day where there was, like, all this gold at the bottom of the Caribbean and, like, all these different people have, like, claims on it. Like, the Colombian government has a claim. Venezuela government has a claim. But no one can actually really get to it. And then, like, private companies are still looking for, like, this lost gold from the Spanish Empire, the bottom of the Caribbean. And they say it's worth like billions of dollars. That'd be nuts. Would be sweet. We should get down there. Yeah, we should get America should get on that. Yeah, let's get on that. Push it all back into yep. Fort Knox, get back on the uh the gold standard. And fix all the problems. Well, that'd be it. Yep. I think we'd be good again. Interest rates would drop. Yeah. Everyone could afford a house. The that dollar used to would be, be a worth thing. more. Yep. Go back we'll go back to nineteen seventy one or whatever that I think I just solved everything. We just have to find that gold. Yeah. I did. I was listening to Rogan. Uh, he had this guy from the America American West on. I can't remember his name. His last name might have been West, but he spit this fact out. So you know the Forty Nine ers, right? Mm-hmm. The football. Do you know how they got their name? Yeah, Gold Gold Rush gold of eighteen forty nine. He said that in that year, California produced more gold than the rest of the world did in the previous hundred years combined. Wow. So that's like that's what I mean. Like America has had every single resource. We 
more gold in one part of one state in one year than the rest of the world had combined for a hundred years. Damn, dude. So much fucking money. It's unbelievable. And then they did the same thing. They found the same thing up in Alaska. You know, and then, you know, and then we find the oil that was, and that's like another thing, like the, the native population. Like, you, you, did you see that movie yet? Killers of the Flower Moon? I did, yeah. So they, they push all the Indians on Oklahoma and that ties back into far and away too. Cause that's where he went and got his land. Mm-hmm. Cause they gave, they put all the reservations like the Indians, like what's the shittiest piece of land in this whole country? Ah, Oklahoma, there's nothing fucking there. Soil sucks, whatever. Cause they had, they, the soil did suck. They ended up having the dust bowl there in the thirties. But they just go, and then the Osage and these other pe- and other people, settlers, whatever, they find all this oil right underneath their feet. They get mac it, you know, super wealthy, and they're just like, we got to get these Indians off this land because we need that oil. And they just keep pushing them around until they end up in the literally the shittiest places in the world. That's yeah, nuts. Yeah, not good. Yeah, not great. Um, all right then. But everybody's done bad things. And my people weren't here yet. We were still being potato farmers in Ireland when that was going on. All right. <laughs> all right, then. You, and you were in Italy. Yeah, I was Yeah, yeah. I was gone. Um, all right, then. On that note, we could wrap it up. Uh, thank you, everybody, for listening. Thanks for watching. We'll be back tomorrow with a free swim. We'll see you then.